I like chanting. Uh, but the thing is to do it simultaneously so that it's not lopsided. Um, we're so addicted to the idea that, you know, if only I get it, then the problem will be solved, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it cannot be solved that way. Uh, so the chanting is a, <clears throat> it's a device, you know. It's a device that doesn't necessarily show you directly how you get there. Mm -hmm. mm, but it's a, it's a simple but sophisticated device um, to get you there. Um, now, you know, if I was speaking to an Asian audience, an older Asian audience, not, not a young Asian audience, because young Asian audience very much, you know, the same wavelength as, uh, because we have become so educated now everywhere. Mm, so the promise of, you know, education and, um, the hopes that, you know, once everyone is educated, right, we will all agree, this is good, that is not good. Well, welcome to America, you know. <laughs> um, welcome to American response to the pandemic, you know. I mean, I'm biased, you know, I would like to say, oh, those people are uneducated. But, you know, check their credentials. They're not as uneducated as I assume my people who disagree with me are, you know. Anyway, um, so if I was speaking to an older Asian audience, you know, then I would say to them, like, um, okay, you know, how about now you try to understand a little bit of what you're chanting? Because it's the other thing. It's like a lot of chanting and and no, you know, kind of no understanding of what's going on. So... In either case, there are pros and cons. Uh, it delivers certain results, you know. Mm, so likewise, you know, uh, because we are so much in investigative mode, you know, which like, for example, this group, you know, like we don't chant this, you know, we, we investigate. Um, if, if we say, you know, starting from now, every Sunday, you know, we will just chant, you know. I think very soon there's only one person chanting to themselves, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and this chant, uh, by the way, is not, you know, the word chant could mean a lot of things as well. This chant is not, you know, like the Hindu Kirtan chant, you know, mm -hmm. which is emotionally very satisfying. Uh, this is like more like plain chant, you know. La 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 So But you know for the last twenty five, twenty six hundred years uh that kind of chanting was one of the main uh kind of activity main practices. And more and more, as I now look at um, this early Kagyu uh, tradition, the early Kagyu uh, masters and their styles of practice, I'm, I'm getting more and more kind of, of uh, coming more and more to this conclusion that many of the early Kagyu masters um, didn't do a lot of the things that now uh, Kagyu lineages are doing. Um, and that could be true for all the other lineages too. I just don't know. Uh, I've not spent enough time investigating that. But when you look at these early Kagyu masters, um, like for example today, you know, in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, often when somebody gets, you know, involved and serious enough, um, people start doing what we call deity yoga deity practice of seeing yourself as the deity and then so there's these you know sadhana so um, manual meditation manuals to uh, ritual as well as meditative manuals that you chant and you perform and you know long and short various versions uh, but i think the early kagyu masters um, did not really do this i mean they practice deity for sure 
but it's a lot less liturgically based. It was more, for lack of a better word, it's more meditative, uh, as in cultivating certain mental abilities uh, at your own pace, uh, in your own kind of space, uh, rather than um, a group activity. Oh, let's all do this together. So what did they do for group activity? I think they chanted sutras. As well um, as an individual activity, they also chanted sutras. Sutras being words of the Buddha. So the equivalent would be something like if it's, it was in the Christian tradition, you know, the Bible, the words of God. Then there are biblical commentary that, you know, all the early masters, the church fathers, for example, you know, <clears throat> wrote and, you know, further defined and unpacked and organized. Yeah, all those are commentarial and what we would call commentarial work. So people don't chant commentarial work because, you know, it's like these came from later masters, whereas the Buddha words, the sutras, those are seen as, you know, potent uh, because they are words of the Buddha. The way Christians think of the Bible as the word of God. Uh, but in Western Christianity, also the chanting of the Bible uh, is basically not, mm, not part of the practice, except for perhaps the Book of Psalms. Even the Book of Psalms, I think um, Protestant congregations have by and large stopped you know chanting we keep, um you keep i um, keep losing you i don't know if it's me or you mm, i don't know everybody else have to say <laughs> whether it's me or you <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh mine is saying i have low bandwidth is yeah anybody i'm, else having I'm trouble? seeing everybody else <laughs> i'm not having any trouble I, I seem yeah to <laughs> um yeah so um you know, maybe Psalms, you know, uh, and then in now, if you look at uh, uh, Jewish yeah, communities and then the more kind of Orthodox Jewish, then you'll see that they are engaged in chanting, you know. Um, even when studying, they, 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 they read out loud, you know. Mm hmm. Uh, recently, I've been watching a lot of Netflix on uh, this um, Orthodox, uh, you know, produced in Israel. There's quite a few movies and series about ultra-Orthodox Hasidic communities, you know. And you see, you know, like in, in, in all their um, uh, kind of Talmud studies, right, they, 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 they say out loud, and not only that, it's a physical activity, so, right? There's a certain way of moving the body. So, so it's, 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 a, it's an embodied experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I think certain Protestant um, tendencies <laughs> that began with, you know, the Protestant Reformation uh, has taken um, body-based practices out of Western Christianity. And so a bifurcation between body and mind. Uh, so then, you know, it comes to also uh, when we are studying uh, this as we do every Sunday, which is good. Don't get me wrong. We should do that. I'm trying to encourage people to also understand that in the old country, in the good old days, so to say, or for most of the history of this country, kind of text they are embedded within a broader context where you know more physically involved practices are always going hand in hand mm -hmm. so like even then back to like deity practice visualization practice i find that increasingly i feel that you know it has been overemphasized uh, and so people are busy trying to cram these images into their heads. 
uh, then again, it gets also jammed up, you know, up in the head. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then it it worsens certain uh, American neurosis. <laughs> <laughs> it worsens it. And so, not so directly, because I never explain. I'm not, you know, trying to indoctrinate. Uh, so when I chant the sutras, you know, on Facebook in the mornings, I don't talk about why. Just chant, you know, and because and talk about why, and then that turns into another talk to, you know, jam up the head. Um, just hoping, you know, and I always give the source. I said you can get this text here or there. I don't know uh, if the karma is right. It might get some someone watching to go huh maybe i should try chanting it too <laughs> uh, and, and you know certainly you can chant in english you know if 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 trying to make the tibetan sounds or the pali sounds or the sanskrit sounds is just too hard you know um but i think uh, it's funny you know if people were to watch me chant, I think they're more likely to stay longer if it was in Tibetan or Pali or Sanskrit than if it was in English. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the woo-woo is not so strong, I suppose, if it's in English. It's like, ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of those chants, like when I've seen, um, you know, like on documentaries, when I've seen Buddhist monks at the uh-huh. temple. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they're just making, they're not really doing a liturgy, but mm-hmm. they are doing like, a, you know, I love the way that sounds. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's, I, that I, but now I think I know what you're talking about, the sutra, because I think we've done that, haven't we, Melissa, with the, with this class? When we first started, we were doing some we were doing some kind of chanting, and I thought, "Oh my gosh, I'll never get that." But I loved listening to it. I think and I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking, <laughs> I was just wondering if that's what you meant by the chanting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyway, mm-hmm. there's a lot of you. I mean, I think if you go to YouTube, you know. If you say Buddhist chant, you know, uh, then a lot of times you get musical renditions of mantras. Mm -hmm. Mm. And especially like Tibetan tradition, uh, all these mantras. Mm. It's not even Tibetans doing it. It's Chinese Buddhists, Taiwanese Buddhists who have adopted Tibetan Buddhist practice. And they're very good at turning these into sing-songy things. Mm. But closer to the chant that I'm talking about is more mm, like in Zen communities eh, that eh, they chant the Heart Sutra usually. That's about the only chant, especially in the West, that you're going to hear. Uh, but again, in the old country, you know, uh, people are chanting all kinds of sutras. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's monotonal and it's. It's pretty rapid. Yeah. Dum 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 I love the way it sounds. I love to listen to it. So anyway, you might have to create a Facebook profile for your dog and then friend me. Then or your imaginary dog. I don't know if you have a dog or not, but I've got two. Oh yeah, you could create a profile for them. They're visiting. <laughs> yeah, and don't 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 friend anybody else, you know. <laughs> I don't do Facebook anymore. Turned off by it for some reason. No, that's what I mean. Like you yeah. can create a very limited one where you only access the Dharma. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> and if it's your dog or a random picture of an ancestor, <laughs> you know, no friend is gonna go, Oh, is that <laughs> you know, can let me friend her, you know. That's a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, uh, there are a few people who are like this that I've told them. I said most of the things I think it's a convenience. I tried. I tried creating a website um, and directing people there, but people are just not going there. 
because we have become habituated, you know, a lot of us. Uh, and then the habituation is such, like everything else in samsara, uh, we either are or we are not, you know, like we either like cannot control ourselves and stuck in Facebook or we have completely renounced Facebook. <laughs> So I've said to some people, I said, I'm not trying to be difficult. I have tried to support other platforms. It's just not so convenient. And <laughs> it's sort of like setting up a Buddhist center way out in the, you know, in the country. In theory, we all like the idea. Ooh, let's go to Jasper, right? But how many times do you, you know, when you think of going to Jasper, not, not to... <laughs> single out something but i know there's a buddhist center you know idyllic out in the country but how many times have you thought of going to jasper and actually ended up there well you know for a hundred times you think about it you go twice same on uh yeah i created the website it's like oh everybody oh it's very nice but nobody goes there on a regular basis because you know they go to facebook you know <laughs> so anyway i told some friends i said well you could just create a profile <laughs> Don't use your name so that other people can't see you, <laughs> like people you know, you know? Yeah. And like they it. won't get offended if you won't accept their friend request, you know? You know, it's Chow Chow's profile, you know? <laughs> and Chow Chow likes to listen to Buddhist chants, you know? And then you just friend the person who does Buddhist chant. <laughs> Uh, anyway, speaking of that, you know, this Bodhicaya Vatara Shantideva's um, series is going to start. So it will be on Zoom. Uh, then it will also be on Facebook Live. Uh, again, the Facebook Live one is easy. You don't need to set up Zoom or anything. You just randomly go and, you know, kind of lurk around um, and then leave without feeling like, you know, oh, they know I left. <laughs> So Zoom is a different level of commitment, um, but this will be live casted on um, Facebook twice a week, Tuesdays and Saturdays, uh, Shantideva's Bodhicaya Avatara. Mm. So anyway, I heard that you all have started looking at chapter 30. Yes. Of the uh, songs of Milarepa. Uh -huh. could, I, could I ask a quick question about yes, the sure. Avatara? Um, I was just wondering if the Bodhicharya Avatara is also something that is chanted? Uh, Bodhicharya Avatara, mm, well, in terms of like, you know, when when monks are studying it at the, the seminary, they would try to memorize it. And to memorize it, you, you chant, you know. So that's one of the reasons for chanting too. But uh, as a devotional act i have not seen so much of that except for the last chapter the dedication chapter okay. that is chanted and included into you know liturgical practices yeah because again shantideva is like not buddha word even if it is a classic you know a very famous a very like you know um, a very profound, a very, you know, uh, uh, deep set of instructions. There, there is less of a tradition of chanting non-Buddha word, in other words. Okay. Yeah. Mm. But I have, you know, and I will recommend that people somehow incorporate uh, Bodhicaya Vatara in their daily practice so that whatever practice that they're doing as part of it, uh, you you chant uh, you chant you read you read out loud a few pages each day so you go from cover to cover you finish you start again cover to cover finish start again cover to cover every day you know uh, like 10 verses 10 stanzas you know 10 stanzas 10 stanzas 10 stanzas you know until the end and start again until the end start again <clears throat> yeah Mm. Uh, like the Milarepa songs, uh, they are chanted um, once a year on the anniversary of Milarepa's passing. 
then monasteries, nunneries, uh, they were all gathered together to chant uh, these songs. And so these songs are performed, uh, so to say. So chapter 30 continues in this focus on yeah, basically four chapters, right? That is uh, centered on these uh, spirit beings, uh, the five Sedigma sisters. Uh, and chapter 30 is uh, interesting. Uh, the framing of this is um, the chief of the five, uh, who is called Tsaringma. Uh The chief of the five is uh, not well. Right, uh, so it's a little it's it's timely, so to say. <laughs> it gives you an insight of uh, what what very traditional Tibetans will think uh, in terms of the current pandemic. Mm. Yeah, like like you know, Tibetans. Uh, you know, it's not like I mean, not all Tibetans. You know, an educated meaning Dharma educated Tibetan. It's not a simplistic answer that they provide, but definitely, depending on the levels of context of the of conversation and, and or discourse, you, you would say, you know, oh, this is why yeah, we're having a pandemic. So one layer, yeah, the story could easily be about now. <laughs> people not keeping their vows. Yeah, people not keeping their vows, right? And then... Um, and, and it's not a personal, it's not just one person. It's one person's situation impacting other persons. Um, and other person's situation somehow getting involved. Yeah, Karma is an aspect, a central aspect of teaching on karma is, I, I don't like this expression because I think it skews our understanding, but I'll begin with it, right? A central issue about karma is your responsibility. It's you taking responsibility for your actions, right? Now, I don't like that because it 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 quickly turns into again a type A American neurosis. It's all about me, except that now it's not necessarily egocentric me. But even in the seemingly non-egocentric me, it's tied to uh, a, a subtle, different, but effectively same kind of self-grasping. Yeah, so karma becomes like, you know, uh, and karma wrongly used can become really a powerful um, um, ideology for certain types of politics, certain types of politics that I don't share. You know, it's like, take responsibility. You are poor, you made a choice to be poor. <laughs> you know? You are doing well, well, good for you. You made the right choices in life. You know? A, a karma, really. A, 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 a misunderstanding of karma, in my opinion, can become very a powerful ideology uh, for certain types of politics that I'm completely not comfortable with. But yes, karma is about uh, an understanding of we make choices, choices have consequences. However, it's not as simplistic as that. Yeah, there is a whole web that involves other people. Uh, things happening or not happening, it's not just only about the choice that you have made. It's also about are there conditions that come from other people, that come from circumstance, that comes together uh, for it to manifest. And so in this case, right, uh, if you remember this story, the epidemic is said to, uh, the immediate cause of the epidemic is Tseringma causing it. Yeah, it says her breath, 
turn into the epidemic that then afflicted the area. Why did her breath become like that? She was ill. Where did her illness come from? At least the proximate cause? Some villages uh, were burning something toxic that then caused her to be ill. And then when she was ill, everyone around her, like her spirit retinue, were also unwell. And quite naturally, from their perspective, yeah, they unleash the epidemic onto others. So when Milarepa said, you know, you wicked, wicked, <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 we, we didn't mean to harm. It's just, we were not well. Which I think a lot of times we would say that, you know, I, I, I wasn't, you know, I was just unwell. And so I was in a bad mood. And to start with, you know, it's not because of me. It's those guys burning, <laughs> you know, toxic stuff in, in my neighborhood that gave me this pounding headache that caused me to yell at everyone in the house and everyone in the house is unhappy and then bad juju, <laughs> right, resulted, right? You see how messy it gets, how quickly, you know? And that's kind of the situation here. Yeah, nonetheless, Milarepa says, you know, you forgot your vows. Your vow of not harming. You forgot your commitments. Your commitments of benefiting beings. You see, nonetheless, Milarepa, you know, in the role that he is playing for them. So I think this is also necessary to say. Milarepa is not yelling through the mountains and, and, and villages like, you know, woe upon you, you know, repent. <laughs> he wasn't that kind of a prophetic figure. Yeah, he, he didn't go like bear witness to their sins and iniquities <laughs> in the style of, you know, a Jewish prophet. Yeah. He didn't do that. These are his disciples. Therefore, he said, but I know you can have so many reasons to tell me why this has happened. But insofar as something that you can do something about, then focus on that, which is you forgot your commitments. You forgot your vows. So I wouldn't even say that that is the cause of this problem. But that is a cause to the problem which Tseringma could take care of. You take care of that. It's like, you know, Milarepa didn't say, you know, go pass legislation so that people cannot burn toxic things. <laughs> He's not saying don't do that. It's just saying right now, hey, you Tseringma, you know, your your illness huh, has unleashed this epidemic upon these people. Don't don't talk to me about how somebody was burning toxic stuff that caused this. More immediately, right now, you forgot your vows, your 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 commitment to benefit beings. Let's get that fixed. Let's get that right. That let's sort that out. Let's straighten that out. Then everything else can fall into place from there. Yet, yeah, so this is the lesson of karma that we need to take to heart. Without, you know, throwing out uh, the complexity of what karma is uh, and how subtle and so how yeah so it's it's like you know 
keeping in mind on the one hand the complexity of how karma works, but being clear about what we can do even in the midst of that complexity. I think that is like the main point. Make sense? <laughs> So there can there is no simplistic answer. So we should not substitute, you know, our old simplistic answers with new vocabulary, but basically meaning the same thing. Yeah, it used to be God's will, and now it's like, oh, it's karma. <laughs> right? Even in theistic traditions, you know, it's like, dare you claim that you know God's will? Right? Even if you take seriously. Yeah, the theistic understanding. How often people say, oh, it's God's will. You, your little mind can comprehend God in all its, his godness, right? You know, you can't. But nonetheless, you know, we have to act. We have to make choices. So again, this chapter here, you know, uh, so page 350, uh, a plague with a great epidemic. There were many types of disease, such as white and black pox, blood disease, black, blackening fever, Anyavali, Bidambali, Kashana Yarajali, and Dak Darijali, and all these different illnesses. Many humans and livestock died. Mm -hmm. Uh, you might say, well, this wasn't a universal pandemic. It was universal enough. <laughs> For the people there, the world looked like it was going to end. And there was no awareness of like, oh, there is the South American continent. Maybe they don't have the epidemic. <laughs> yeah, so for the people that were there, their known world was struck by this epidemic. And so anyway, uh, one of Serima's uh, attendants right, came to Milarepa uh, and said, you, you need to come with me. Uh, my mistress is really in a bad place. Uh, so they jump on the magic carpet, it seems, right? She put out some rug and then, you know, Milarepa touched it and whoosh, you know, they went. Okay. And so they got there and um, so immediately, you know, and then uh, she explained, you know, she said, as to the condition for my becoming ill, last summer there were herders who lit a great bonfire. That specifically, in the footnotes it says, this bonfire involved the burning of flesh, skin, and hair. So it wasn't a, an innocent bonfire, you know, to keep warm uh, herders. For whatever reason, maybe out of desperation or whatever, they were burning whatever they could find in order to keep a fire going. But this fire, the smoke from that fire caused me to become ill. As to when? It was during the first month of autumn, during the waning moon that I became a bit unwell. Then since the 11th of the middle month of autumn, it has become extremely painful. And so I sent for you because of my breath. So here, you know, when this spirit being is unwell, then the breath that comes out of her is toxic, is toxic, is noxious. Because of my breath, a variety of human illnesses have broken out in this land. 
and the epidemic has caused great disturbance here. This is the state of things. And we are told, Milarepa's response is, she has broken her commitment. I mean, in a way, to be fair to her, you could say, but, right? You could say, but, you know, she didn't mean to. Milarepa says, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. So as Milarepa, you know, admonish her and say, you know, it's hopeless. I'm going now. Yeah, I can't help you. I think that is really to bring home the point. Like, if you don't see your part in this problem, then there is no solution. Yeah? And I, I, I want to say, you know, that's not the whole cause of the problem. But again, I think so often we think, oh, can't do anything about this because it's out there and totally not see my part in this. And in a way, we can only at best see our part and fix our part, which is what I think Milarepa is telling her. Yeah, in some ways, you know, when, when I read this at the beginning, I thought, oh, Milarepa is unreasonable. Maybe in some way he was unreasonable, but I think it was also being very skilled in how to get Serengma to see her part in this problem. And then she said, we are ignorant beings. Though we have this slight illness of delusion, please do not say this. Generally, if the virtuous worldly devas of the higher classes are not harm, then for the most part, we will not do any detriment. In particular, we have not purposely disregarded your command, nor have we intentionally done any harm to beings ourselves or sent anyone else to do. For example, just as the river here overflowed in the last month of summer, saturating all of the river banks in the same way the demons of our class along with their retinue as well as the servant pisachas and rakshakshas the many hundreds that enjoy flesh and savor blood created harm and detriment however if i become well i will heed the jitsun's words and clear away the ill sickness of those beings so please please so 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 she said you know like uh it's not that, you know, I sat there and go, huh, let me go, you know, <laughs> uh, wreck havoc. And I think this describes so well how our situation, you know, that we don't, when we are, when things are not going right for us, when we don't feel right, you know, we don't even need to think about how to go harm others and annoy others but our breath so to say has that power of causing harm to others then especially in this context you know that she has taken a vow in front of milarepa in the last chapter we saw you know that i'm going to benefit beings i'm going to do my best so Milarepa said, that part, you own up to that part. <laughs> you own up to that part. You don't see what is at stake. In other words, Milarepa is saying, you know, you don't see what is at stake, you know, and yet you want to give me this sophisticated answer to why you are not responsible. <laughs> Now, so what Milarepa did, it says here, you know, this is like a recipe for clearing epidemics. <laughs> it says, recited uh, the hundred syllable purifying ritual. So that is probably referring to Vajrasattva practice, for those of you who know that practice. 
then made many supplications to the Guru and three jewels and performed a life extension ritual of Ushnisha Vijaya. Uh, Ushnisha Vijaya is a practice uh, of one of the deities of longevity. And this female aspect, uh, a form of Tara, uh, with eight arms and three faces, um, very commonly still within Tibetan Buddhist uh, tradition, uh, the, 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 what's known as the thousand offerings of Ushnisha Vijaya uh, is uh, much uh, performed uh, group practice. Um, we were planning to hold one of these um, pre-pandemic uh, schedule for what you know, turned out to be during the pandemic uh, for Malaysia. We're going to take a group of people there on pilgrimage and the tour of Southeast Asia, then one at one of the stops, we were going to do that. Mm. And uh, Melissa went to one of these. Yeah, I was, I was going to do another one, you know. That the mm. first retreat in, in uh, Penang was... Yes, was yeah, on the island side with a lot of people, right? Yeah, with His Holiness. Yeah, with His Holiness, yeah. So this is the Ushnisha Vijaya. And I was planning a second one, not with His Holiness and all that, and also not so chaotic, but just the group that come with me and another local group in the retreat context, rather than come and go, and then random people coming and going, but, you know, there together to kind of deepen this practice. So he did that, huh, Milarepa. From the next morning onward, she was able to rise from her bed and prostrate to him. Then for seven days, directing his awareness, he sent blessings upon her and she became well. Her complexion became even more beautiful and more abundantly radiant than before. So, so he had that power to help her recover and he, he used it. Yeah. So this is another sort of like not so easy to understand, but we know from these anecdotes that it is possible for someone else to intervene. Even if we say, no one can make you a Buddha. Yeah, No one can clear your afflictive emotions for you. No one can sort out uh, the heart entanglements that you have created for yourself. But at the same time, it is not saying nobody can help. Of course, of course, others can help. And in this case, because of Milarepa's powerful realizations, powerful attainments, he directed his mind to healing her and it worked. Yeah, it worked. Now, interestingly here again, uh, another interesting point. Now Milarepa says to her, beautiful one, now you have completely recovered. Therefore, I will now go to help the beings in the town. Milarepa said, okay, you're well now. I need to go help the human beings that are in the towns, that are in the villages. Huh? And then he says to her, tell me, what substances are most agreeable for you? And what kind of practices should be done? So this is, to me, you know, kind of interesting here. Milarepa did not say, well, I'm going to go solve their problems now. Okay, bye-bye. He could have, you know. But he is telling her and telling us, you know, other people who are reading this, that no, her, her she is kind of the direct cause of this epidemic whether she intended it or not. So to clear this, we need to involve her. And so Milarepa asked her, what do you like? What will make you happier? So again, to me, it's really interesting, I think. Um, mm, it's not just saying, I mean, Milarepa could go down there and tell the villagers, you know, this is the ripening of your karma. 
just you know own up to that and fix it you know but no he also can see and he's also i guess teaching us that there are proximate causes of this problem and on that level you can also do something about it which is sitting ma so then she answered she said because of our strong interdependent connections when i am well the people will grad will also gradually become well so if you want to think of her as basic because okay this is not us over interpreting okay because also the mountains bear the same name as the deity so there is a range of five peaks on this mountain range that are identified as the five goddesses so sometimes they are the literally the five peaks sometimes they are the five spirit beings that are in charge of the five peaks so this will be what we would call our environment our physical environment but whereas our physical environment right aren't personified as sentient we think of the environment as basically insentient whereas this original uh, context of these songs uh, is addressed to people who saw the environment as alive trees rocks mountains rivers creek alive and therefore uh, interacts with us and therefore uh, their well-being is interdependent with our well-being However, if you want them to recover quickly, it is a common oath for all us worldly Dakinis that if one of us is not well, then we make everyone unwell and create disturbance. Now he, she's fessing up more. <laughs> she said, like, yeah, we kind of made this oath, you know. Now this oath again, you know, might sound very unreasonable. You're like ugh, how un Buddhist, you know, if you're not well, uh, you, you're going to go make everybody else unwell as well. Yeah. But to me, I think this is telling us hmm, that that's how things are, you know, whether you like it or you don't like it. We're not saying that this is a good way of doing things, but we are saying this is how things tend to be. If one thing is unwell, everything starts to go unwell right when it rains it pours we say that right you woke up and you know woke up on the wrong side of the bed so to say one thing goes wrong and then it seems like the rest of the day is just one after another is this how things should be we're not saying that is this how things tend to be yes we are saying that <laughs> further all the devas and ghosts of samsari existence are stirred from the depths in support and they all join in in this havoc thus the practices you should do are reciting the dharani of the essence of the tathagatas ushnisha many times which is that deity that that form of tara with eight arms the essence mantra recite many times Reciting the profound sutra section of the Mahayana is unclear what this text is. I have a suspicion I know which what text it is. I think it's the 35 Buddhas. Don't ask me why, but I think it is the 35 Buddhas confession. And then the cleansing waste water ritual entailing the sequestering off of the town, meaning what do we call that now? Isolation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you you have to go into isolation. 
Uh, in Tibet, uh, they had this practice uh, because people traded. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how consistently. I remember at the beginning of this pandemic, some of you might have seen that article. Uh, it's talking about Nepali traders who used to travel uh, across the Himalaya to go into Tibet to trade and to come back. Both ways, uh, both directions, they have quarantine. So when they first enter into Tibet, because they come from the lowland, you know, they could be bringing all kinds of disease. So then all these traders are put into uh, basically uh, uh, quarantine for two weeks. Uh, people deliver food, leave outside there. Then after yeah, they, they are fine and everything, after 14 days, sometimes three weeks, then they come out and they're allowed to trade. So likewise, when they go back down to Nepal, shorter quarantine apparently there, there aren't that many you know funny bugs up in the highlands of tibet to bring to the lowlands of nepal so she said this you know uh, sequestering off of the town and then arranging vast torma and puja offerings such as the select white and red offerings ornamenting those with many types of food as you have and then dedicating them with these, the people's illnesses will be quickly pacified. So he goes. He goes down to the village, to the town, and tell them, Your lady was probably displeased due to smoke from the bonfire that struck her. This caused a disturbance. Then all the gods and ghosts of samsaric existence became upset. Because of that, you have this epidemic. Now you should do these rites for clearing obstacles and use these select offerings that I have collected. And so it said that they did that, and then the problem went away. Then, after the Tasha Iserima and her sister, they were all good again and happy again, they came to see Milarepa uh, in Thanksgiving uh, offered him uh, all kinds of nice things uh, and then um, sang about his kindness his what he did to save her uh, so on 355 it says uh, you gave me the blessing of transference uh, meaning poa uh, those are instructions for uh, a good rebirth. Uh, so in case she doesn't survive this, you know, first he gave her instructions on how to go. Uh, poa is basically, you know, you some of you have heard this practice, poa, poa. Uh, basically, it's uh, the technique to go to a good place from this to the next life. So first he gave her that. Then... You recited mantra from a purifying ritual. Then you pointed out to me uh, the mind beyond birth and death and the certainty of realization quickly arose. Yeah, so there is how on the relative level certain things, certain practices that needs to be done. Then on the absolute level, certain understanding needs to be in place so he gave her both relative practices which in our day and time now includes right <laughs> the the health prevention that is available to us it's saying that the administration of mantra and medicine are too common uh, things given to people who are ill in Tibet. Uh, mantra and medicine. And sometimes there's a fine line between the two, <laughs> at least in their context.
in Bhutan, uh, this landlocked uh, last surviving Vajrayana Buddhist kingdom in the world, uh, which neighbors Nepal and India and China. Uh, so right now, uh, they are really concerned about what's going on in India, you know. Anyway, in Bhutan, you know, when the vaccines came, I have friends in Bhutan, the very educated ones, the social elites, you know, like the wife, you know, was expressing um, like the, um, uh, hesitancy with the vaccine. Uh, so I know the wife much better. And then when we talk and she was like, oh, you're like my husband. He thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> The husband is like, no, we have to take it, you know. She's like, no, I don't know, too soon, everything. Eventually, she took it, you know. And they they vaccinated. Unfortunately, now their concern now is the second dose might not be available because they got all their vaccines from India. India thought, you know, arrogantly, in hindsight, that they, you know, dodged it and they are fine. So they gave and this vaccine to Bhutan. Of course, Bhutan's population is a fraction of India's population. Anyway, uh, what I want to say is that uh, if you look around the internet, you know, like when the vaccines arrive, you know, like literally when the plane landed in Bhutan at the main inter at the main international airport, yeah, the the monastic authority of Bhutan, which is a government department because religion and state uh, is hand in hand. Uh, so the Ministry of Health with the Ministry of Religion uh, together organize a big ceremony for the landing of the vaccine in Bhutan. <laughs> so all kinds of purification ritual was done at the airport to bless the vaccine. Then when the vaccine went into each of the 20 provinces in Bhutan, again, when they arrived, it was arriving with a lot of pomp and circumstance. Then the local religious heads would come out and do the ritual, do the purification, and then they will be the first ones to get the vaccine. Then everybody else in tow, in line. So you give mantra and you give medicine. Yeah. However you want to understand mantra, uh, some of us are more, more willing to say, yeah, there is something going on there. But at the very least, I think what we can appreciate is mantra is the equivalent of psychological, right? Psychological well-being. You feel good. Right? You feel confident. Right? You're not afraid of, right? like oh this is good yeah so that that has to be uh, in there you know but all of that is insufficient yet it only is complete if we know that the mind is beyond birth and death and therefore there's like the bigger assurance, so to say. The four illnesses gathered and dissolved like clouds. My body became pleasant and light like cotton, and many realizations dawned in my mind. You blocked the obstacle of untimely death. The heat that had drawn in from my extremities was restored, the ins and outs of my breath that were cut were rejoined. Thus the messenger of the Lord of Death was put to shame. Lord Yogi, you are so incredibly kind. I, your subject, with the obscuration of inferior birth, and forgetful, and my mindfulness is weak. So she fessed up, you know. <laughs> she said, I, I, it's a lapse of the moment, you know. I, I, I was uncomfortable, I was in a lot of pain, so I unleash uh, all this harm. Uh, but your restoration of my life force here is something that in this life I could never forget. 
To repay the kindness of protecting me, I'll offer any cities, any powers that you may wish, and never transgress your command, any command you give. From this time forth until the attainment of ultimate unsurpassed enlightenment, through the river flow of pure aspiration, like the body with its shadow, may I accompany you, not separate for a single instant. Then when you have actualized Buddhahood in the pure realm that's tamed by your form bodies, just like the first five disciples of the Buddha, may we be the first of your retinue. So this is making aspirations and connection to Milarepa. And say, when you finally manifest the full activity of a complete Buddha, let us five be your first five disciples. And then invoking the actual first five disciples of the Buddha of our times, Buddha Shakyamuni. And these five, uh, they were formerly guards uh, of his kingdom that his father sent to go bring him back. <laughs> but instead, they left the, the palace as well and became you know, spiritual seekers themselves. So when Siddhartha became a Buddha, uh, the first people he went to see were these five companions. Yeah, who was sent by the father to retrieve him, but instead they themselves <laughs> left as well. So Tsering says, you know, may we be like those five, uh, the first five to receive your teachings when you are full Buddha. Questions, comments? One of the things that I'm hearing here, here is that Milarepa gave the goddesses, gave um, the Sringma sisters these teachings, and they took like a, a bodhicitta or bodhisattva vow. But they mm -hmm. also had a previous oath that if they got sick, then they would make everybody sick. So they Say that again. They about having an oath. Yes. But if they got sick, then they'd make everybody sick. So they had these complete these. Yeah, complete that things. that oath is less of a sense of an oath that they promise anyone. Yeah, that is more. They're saying we all agreed that if one of us is sick, right, the rest of us will act out. Right. Yes. Okay, so it wasn't like an oath, like a sacred oath. It was just... No, no, no. This is the kind of oath that we all make. <laughs> uh, our tribal uh, kind of uh, tendencies are so strong, you know? Mm? Like our in-group. Uh? Uh, so again, very understandable, you know? In, in a way, it's like we need to band together, you know? When we fall, we fall together. When we prosper, we prosper together. And this is our tribal way, you know. So he, she's talking about that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then, of course, you know, bodhicitta is also an oath. Right. But that needs to be the, the true oath that we should be loyal to, but not these kinds of tribal oaths. Uh, the tribal oath, so to say, right, in many ways, very understandable. Like we rise and fall together. Right? But the scope of that is not big enough. Yeah. Build the wall, keep them out, you know. <laughs> okay, sorry, getting political, you know. Yeah. But that that's a, right. it's like, yeah. You know, for as long as things are working, it's fine, you know. But but those things cannot work. <laughs> so bodhicitta is the ultimate oath because it doesn't exclude anyone from this tribe. This is the universal tribe. <laughs> that everyone is included. Now... I totally understand for most people, it's like, no, I, I'm not making that oath because 
it's an impossible oath. Uh, exactly. Like the logistics of like, you know, not leaving anyone out. I mean, it's it's very inspiring. But if you think it through, you, you're not, you know, you also won't make the oath. I don't, I don't know. It's just not practical, right? Very reasonable to say it's not practical. And and it's very reasonable if we think practicality is more important than uh, workability. <laughs> so then we make these, you know, little petty tribal oaths yeah, with different tribes even, you know. Instead of taking the single the singular universal oath of bodhicitta that even no matter how difficult it is to achieve it yeah, we will not waver from it <laughs> uh, so in one of the lojong statements it says don't be so loyal is talking about this don't be so loyal to these petty oaths these petty commitments these limited childish uh, commitments that we we make yeah? thinking that you know it will ensure uh, our well-being and in fact as long as it is limited and small it will not bring the well-being that we're looking for It's like paying off the local goons, you know, so that they won't harass you. Then forever you have to pay them, you know. Don't be so loyal, don't be so predictable. That line from the Lojong precepts. Um, want to call your attention we don't have much time left but I want to call your attention to so after they sang a song praising him so then he responded and kind of went over what happened uh, kind of uh, then the then he he said you know myself you know I'm not nothing that special uh, but what is special is that I connected with I became part of this lineage that contains all this, uh, not just the techniques and the practices, but also the direct experience of how these work and it has come down to me. And so now I can help you by sharing this with you. And so he says this, uh, bottom of 359. Mm. At this time you have taken hold of the path from the next life onward you will always have happiness this present body has many illnesses and your mind experiences heat and cold with the proximate cause of the mental afflictions and the passing conditions coming together the results of previous karma arrive so previous karma uh, those choices that we made uh, that uh, ripen into consequences but if you look closer as to how these consequences bear fruit come together then they work with a proximate cause which is the mental afflictions right now and the passing conditions coming together 
neighbors burning toxic stuff. Negative states of mind being present now. Negative karma from the past. Maturing. When these three come together, you know, it is in this way, uh, your obscured perceptions, that means your experience uh, of unhappiness arise. This is also just a dream and is momentary. But when those moments are multiplied by hundreds of thousands, then you have the sufferings of the lowest hell. So long a time, so difficult to bear. So what, what is suffering, you know? Even the suffering of the lowest hells uh, to the most fleeting suffering, they are all moments of fleeting suffering that aggregate and aggregate and aggregate and aggregate and then becomes what we imagine as, you know, sufferings of the lowest hell. In reality, these appearances do not exist. Quote, external suffering is experienced due to the confusion of non-virtuous latent tendencies. Thus said our teacher, the Buddha Shakyamuni, in reply to Vajragarbha in the Sutra of Definitive Meaning. This is the Lankavatara Sutra. I think the translator missed this reference. So external suffering, the suffering that arises, you know, this is due to the confusion uh, of latent uh, karmic habits, karmic tendencies. Therefore, these imputations are the basis of confusion. If you don't understand that everything is mind, even through attaining dominion of the realm of Brahma, the realm of Brahma is the highest divine realm in this known world. He says, even if you achieve that, but if you don't understand that everything is mind, then there will be no happiness to be found. Meditative equipoise is the meditative equipoise of the ground. The one may abide there for eons, it is a lower path. So here is talking about, you know, you might be able to do some meditations where you experience a deep sense of peace, uh, and relief, uh, but that is not reliable even because there's no understanding. There's only a temporary uh, break from the oppressiveness of suffering. Uh, there's no understanding. All-knowingness, omniscience, is impossible to attain if you keep kind of chasing after this kind of relief. Now, when we have when we're experiencing a lot of suffering, it's quite understandable that we just want some relief. But then if all we're doing is keep looking for temporary relief, Rather than what? Rather than when suffering arise, use that to really change the way you think about suffering, you experience suffering, and really look into, you know, what are the mechanics of this thing that we call suffering? When you do that, when you apply that, then understanding can arise, wisdom can arise, and it's understanding and wisdom that ultimately dispels suffering. Not temporary, you know, states of like comfort and well-being and, and freedom from, you know, illness. Those are not reliable. Therefore, to purify the obscurations and the latent tendencies of karma and afflictions, meditate continuously on bodhicitta, perfecting that look at unborn reality. This is a reference to relative bodhicitta and absolute bodhicitta. So to purify obscurations, karma and afflictions, you meditate continuously on relative bodhicitta, 
which is in a nutshell uh, to dispel self-grasping. Uh, how this, this work of dispelling self-grasping uh, ultimately uh, be accomplished is when we come face to face with birthless reality. Reality that is not determined by time and space, but the way things are. If when they directly perceive that, then we have perfected both relative and absolute bodhicitta. Now we have met due to our karma, he's saying to them. So now banish all laziness and slothfulness and don the great armor of diligence, not being distracted for even a moment, an instant, quickly accomplish something meaningful, you fortunate ladies. <laughs> Questions, comments? Ah, this year's uh, spring allergies uh, especially active. <laughs> I've been wondering if um, <laughs> there's any significance to the use of garland in each of the chapter titles regarding these Syringa sisters. It's referring to a a chain of instructions. Okay. Yeah, the word garland is often uh, referring to a collection of things. In this case, it's a collection of instructions. Yeah. It's not because they are goddesses, you know, garlands, right. or if they are Hawaiians, you know, garlands. <laughs> yeah, it's a string, basically, a string of instructions. Yeah, a, a mala uh, is also a garland. Right. Yeah. have a comment that mm -hmm. um, oh Laura you have a question but I just wanted to say that you know last week this is about where we got to last week so mm -hmm. I haven't read the entire chapter but but this is I think this is where my bookmark was <laughs> <laughs> I've got an off the wall question to ask uh-huh. And I'm kind of hesitant to ask it because I don't even know if it's relative. But, you know, you had talked about how everything is mind. Yes. And you made a comment, and that's what prompted this question. You said that everything is beyond. You said something, everything is beyond I can't remember what you said. I wish I could remember what you said. But it made me think, you know, people talk about uh, climate change and where we are environmentally uh -huh. with the earth. And, you know, that we are essentially, what I hear from people is that we are living on borrowed time. You know, we are, we are facing extinction. Mm -hmm. So what do you... When you hear that and you talk about, I wish I could remember what you said, but when you said we are beyond mind, um, like if, if we did face extinction, extinction, extinction. Who is this we? Yeah, us, humanity. Who? Humanity. Oh, okay. This happened before. Okay. What do you mean? <laughs> yes, yeah, happened before. Uh, from so we've Buddhist. been extinct. Oh, yeah, from the Buddhist perspective, you know, many universes have come and gone. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So even though if we were to face extinction, I can't say that word very good. If we were to face it tomorrow, uh -huh. 
eventually planet Earth would. Oh, some other planet, you know, some other. So we would like maybe go to Mars or someplace. <laughs> yes, you know, possible. Yeah, that's what I, to me, that's comforting. Oh, that will go somewhere? Well, I mean, because I don't think that we are <laughs> extinct. I don't think that we can be extinguished. I think that. Yeah, but uh, you could be reborn in, uh, you know, somewhere very negative. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so therefore, uh, borrowed time or not, you know, uh, we can change, you know, we can get better uh, with our mind, you know, our if heart we, minds now. If we, if we join together, yeah. No, no, no need to join together. Uh, <laughs> even our one, even our my own, one. Yes, yes, our own, you know. Okay. Uh, this idea that. of joining together often becomes a distraction, you know, then you're busy telling other people to get well. Yeah, uh, and we have to, you know, work on our own. That makes sense. Mm. Close to, you know, last Sunday, maybe on Friday, I posted something that said, you know, like, I guess it's like, um, because last, well, this past Monday was my 51st birthday. And uh, so again, on Facebook, <laughs> you know, I posted something and said, you know, like, um, you know, this precious body that we all have, you know, really, after a certain point, uh, it's it just, you know, goes in one direction. Uh, there's no getting better. After a certain point, right, it's right. all just maintenance work, you know and slowing down the breakdown. Uh, and so, uh, so that's the bad news, you know, but the good news is, you know, the mind, the heart, you know, can always get better. It can, you know, to the last moment, it can get better. And we say, if you believe in future lives, you know, the so called last moment is not the last moment, you know, in fact, that last moment is a moment of even great opportunity that to break through into something else, into Buddha state. You know? But, you know, putting aside the more explicitly religious stuff, uh, speaking in a way that maybe everyone can, you know, relate to is like, don't forget that your heart, mind and its well being, you know, can get better body no it cannot get better <laughs> it's just you know putting uh you know uh, a fix here before you know some other problem turns up there and then managing that and then some other problem turning up over there you know it's just continuously and there is no getting better you know as far as the body is concerned but if we spend all our time thinking of the body you know then we lose all the possibilities of uh, being in a better state of mind state of heart which is possible till the last and beyond yeah yeah i i keep saying i like getting older my uh -huh. body doesn't, but I like it. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I feel like it gets better with age. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? That's such. A, that's. I wish I could come into this. Yeah, but because that's that's growth, you know. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, you know. I had to go through. But that for crap. some people, it gets worse. You know. Yeah. The mind. Uh, yeah. A lot of people. Then somebody posted something like, oh, it's good to be reminded that because on some days I feel like the mind is getting worse. Then upon discussing more, we, we, we see that what this person is talking about is what we, what I would consider more superficial aspects of the mind, 
which is she's talking about, you know, she cannot remember that well and has a harder time retrieving information stored away. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's not the mind that we're talking about, you know. That is, you know, that, yeah, that, that could get worse and worse and worse, you know. I uh, can get, that is not, you know, uh, like remembering, controlling, all of that. No, it's talking about something else that can get better, you know. <laughs> and meaning self-grasping, you know. The, if you release one inch, you know, you, you experience one inch of freedom. If you release one foot of it, you know, you experience one foot of freedom. If you release 10 feet, if, 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 if self-grasping is quantifiable, then if you release 10 feet, you know, you experience 10 feet of freedom. And that can always become greater and greater and greater and greater until it's without limit. But if we don't know how to skillfully relate to uh, different aspects of the mind, so if we grasp after good memory, because that was always one of my strengths, oh, now as you're losing it, there will be a lot of suffering. Uh, so a lot of very educated people suffer a lot because their grasping is built not on material things necessarily. But you know, it's no better if it is built on non-material things. Because non-material things it will also deteriorate. They are compounded. So how intelligent you were, how on top of things you were, all those are part and parcel of the brick and mortar of this self-grasping. We also need to let that go. <laughs> it's very humbling, right? At some point, if you live long enough, you're going to wet your bed and need someone else to clean up for you. Yeah? But if our sense of self is built very strong on being independent, uh, not needing to embarrass myself or anyone, then they are part of the brick and mortar of self-grasping, you know. Then, of course, it will get worse and worse and worse, the mind. Mm -hmm. You know, like right now, if our happiness of mind is so tethered to our control of body, then we're not headed to a good place. Trust me. Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so first we build it on, you know, our toys. Then we mature into building it on our uh, career and success. Then we build it on our family. And then we build it on our intellect, you know, all along our intellectual prowess, you know, prowess, our reputation, but all these are, right, unreliable brick and mortar of self-grasping. So we have to see that, you know, and to habituate that. <laughs> yeah. Make it a habit not to let this house of ego grasping, self grasping build and build and build, including the brick and mortar of I don't have grasping. <laughs> That's the last desperate attempt by ego grasping to continue to build. <laughs> yeah. That's when they're building these imaginary floors, you know. <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, if we if we habituate them to be so real, the imaginary floors when they collapse, it's still going to be pretty heavy. You can be buried by all these imaginary floors.
and then we say happy Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> seems to me like you just like beautifully described the human the whole human condition <laughs> and it also seems as though it's it's like almost inescapable almost <laughs> <laughs> from one perspective there's no escape it is inescapable yeah yeah from another perspective is wide open freedom mm. <laughs> Then now the non-duality of that, that's, that's, that's what the path is. As an abstract, it sounds like a great philosophical statement, the non-duality of that, you know? But, but that has to be integrated together, you know? Yeah, the no escape and wide open freedom. Yeah, the, the no escape from the shit is real, you know, and <laughs> wide open freedom. <laughs> that's where acceptance comes in handy <laughs> and detachment <laughs> oh, me. okay so um i think next sunday yeah i should be able to meet but we'll see <laughs> hope so otherwise keep going keep going <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah, Thank you all have a good weekend. <laughs> yeah. You too. <laughs> wow.